Hi, everybody, and welcome to tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Uh, my name is Martha Campbell, and I'm MFA's Communications Manager. Our digital discussion tonight is with sculptor Nada Romanis uh, Abizade, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, Abizade was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and she currently lives in Virginia. Uh, a former graphic designer, her focus was primarily on corporate identity. Her initial ceramic style was influenced by her career, but since moving to the US, she has been drawn to the lines and forms of nature, creating organic and fluid stoneware objects with less structure and inspired by the East and West Coast. I would also like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs for the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to help bridge the gap between artists and the public, and he'll be our guide through the art world tonight. Okay, thank you, Martha, for your usual uh, very uh, concise introduction and advice to listeners and participants. Uh, and Nada, thank you for agreeing to do this. So, uh, Nada, uh, is a relatively new member to the MFA and her work immediately caught the attention of all of us involved with the Will Talks. And so we have invited her and she's uh, graciously agreed to uh, participate tonight. Um, although with some trepidation, I guess Martha told her my <laughs> reputation or something. So anyhow, but I'm glad that she's decided to join us. So Nada, uh, being from Lebanon, and having uh, you mentioned in some of our conversations that the Civil War in Lebanon uh, did interfere in some ways with your life and your education, do you want to talk about a little bit, uh, say anything about your uh, Lebanese background and how it has affected your decision to become an artist? Sure. Thank you for the introductions, uh, Martha and Neil. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I grew up uh, liking art as a child. I uh, often um, uh, went to art camp in the summer. I wasn't sure what exactly I wanted to be doing as an adult. I was attracted to uh, jewelry design, uh, architecture, um, several fields. And then came the day to decide what I'll be doing in college. And uh, I uh, did a year and a half of uh, general, um, you know, uh, like I, I started uh, my education thinking that I would major in advertising. Mm. But then the civil war started, uh, universities were, uh, shut down here and there, and I decided to transfer to uh, the Corcoran in Washington, D.C., and major in graphic design, which was not offered in Beirut at that time. So uh, by doing a bit of research, I thought I found what I was passionate about, and I, I did. I, I was passionate about graphic design, and um, I loved uh, all the classes that I took. I uh, took some uh, photography classes, some printmaking classes, obviously the core and graphic design courses. I loved uh, typography. And uh, uh, once I graduated, I went back to Beirut and worked in my field for a few years, mostly in print graphic design. Um, and uh, I, um, I like the projects I worked on and uh, let me ask you a couple of follow up questions related to that part of your life, if I may. Sure. Was your family uh, uh, artistic uh, or uh, and or supportive of the arts? It sounds like since you went to art camps that they encouraged and, and supported your interest in art. So my sister is an architect and uh, the rest of the family was not into arts really. It was more uh, myself and my sister, but they, uh, they encouraged me to do whatever I was passionate about, yeah. Okay, and then how did you choose the Corcoran? I mean, the Corcoran is a very fine art school, but you grew up thousands of miles away. So how did you connect with DC and the Corcoran? So uh, my brother was living in D.C. at the time, and I had visited D.C., and I 
loved it as a city and uh, it was um things were different back then you didn't see as much you didn't learn as much about universities online as you did now so i you know i had a basic uh knowledge of um i, I researched a few universities in the area and I applied to a couple of them and I ended up picking the Corcoran. It was a tiny program, but a great one. I had great teachers and I, I loved my experience there. Oh, good, good. Um, did you spend any time in the Corcoran galleries? Uh, the museum has such a wonderful collection of American art particularly, but uh, international art as well. Uh, I did, so uh, not, um, so some of my classes were in the museum building because part of the school was in the building and that was an amazing experience to, to, to be there. But the graphic design uh, department was in Georgetown. Uh, so I went back and forth and uh, I took my photography classes and some of my academic classes in the downtown museum building. And um, so, yeah, I felt that I had the privilege to spend some years in this amazing space. And, and of course, you came to the National Gallery and uh, heard tours and lectures there. I did. Yes, yes. I remember <laughs> spending uh, a few hours facing a, a, an icon and writing a paper about it and uh -huh. so yeah many trips to the dc museums and so i made the most out of my experience yeah. in washington so, DC. Yeah. and i'm still here i'm still in the area where i came back to it at least yeah a lot of people still don't recognize how much washington dc actually has to offer to uh everyone who's interested in the visual arts and the other arts but uh, I don't think that's quite as much as it was when I was a kid, when I was young, you know, people thought of Washington as government and, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, let's start to look at the slides. Uh, I do um, think your work is very impressive and uh, beautiful. I did take one studio course as an undergraduate in ceramics. And so I've always been attracted to uh, strong work in that field. So Martha, can we cue up the first slide? Yeah, these are just, uh, I especially like the one on the left, Nada, uh, because I think that it uh, says so much about what I see in your work and its connections to nature. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you make them and, and what your uh, goal is in creating these uh, forms? So the, the photo on the left is of my earliest vessel forms and uh, I was exploring uh, proportions, I was playing around with uh, the placement of the handle, the neck, the angles, and they're clearly inspired by uh, uh, nature both in their detail, the texturing and uh, the, the finish, uh, as well as when they're grouped, um, they talk about you know perspectives that you see in nature, grouping of uh, trees, and um, and with time, uh, see that these were made around 2015. A few years later, I started exploring uh, the concept of making the forms. Um, more uh, pure, so they lost what I felt they didn't really need, the accessories, the handles, uh, the long necks, and they sort of turned into creatures or people maybe. <laughs> uh, they were still vessels in the sense that they still had uh, spouts and they could contain a liquid and uh, but they they started kind of having a life of their own um, as opposed to being a an object i i felt so at least and i've had reactions uh, when you see other um, uh, vessel forms i've had reactions of people asking me if they could you know pet them or or talk about them as if they were people um, 
Um, That's very interesting. I'm fascinated by that because to me, the uh, strong appeal of your work is the texture and the surface uh, patterns, but most of all, it's that they are, to me, pure sculptural forms in the medium of ceramic. And so what I want to do with them, I don't I, I don't tend to anthropomorphose uh, many things, but I want to touch these. I want to, you know, pick them up and, and see how heavy they are and feel their surfaces. Uh, do people ever react in that way? Do you think of them in that way? Uh, yeah, I, I've had friends tell me that they don't look like me, like they're chunky and, you know, rugged and <laughs> um, heavy. And but I I think that their texture is um, definitely very tactile. You want to touch them, and um, I'd like to talk about the the glaze uh, technique that I use on these. If if you think it, it's it's uh, of any interest, um, yes. so with these forms, uh, once I shape them, and you can see in the picture on the right. Uh, that they're coiled. So I start with a uh, slab that's rolled at the bottom and then I form the walls with coils and then smooth them with a very basic tool. Um, and, uh, oh, I was going to show the tool, but I, I can show the tools that I use later. Um, and then once they're completely formed, uh, and they get to a leather hard dryness. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means they're not sticky anymore, but they haven't actually dried. I apply a uh, slip, which is a liquid kind of creamy textured clay to them with a brush and sometimes use like a plastic card or any tool uh, to texture them. And then they dry for weeks and go through the first firing. And after that, I pour glaze on them. And pouring glaze on large vessels is easier, but also gives me the, the textures that I'm, the streaks that I'm looking for. Um, and so the, the slip I used on these was black slip. And then the glaze that I placed them with after the first firing was a light colored glaze. And I scraped off part of the glaze uh, once it dried, exposing the slip. So that's how I end up with the two colors that you're seeing. Well, I think it's very beautiful what you've done. And uh, your explanation makes me wonder as you're working through the process of applying the slip in the glaze, is there any preconceived sort of pattern or design or are you letting the materials sort of uh, suggest to you what the final piece will be like? Um, there is a preconceived idea that I'm trying to achieve uh, because I ex experimented with the glazes enough that uh, I got to a point where if I wanted to get this, you know, black and white effect uh, versus um, some pieces that we'll see uh, later in the slideshow that are uh, more like an aspen uh, tree bark, mostly white with, you know, a few white, uh, dark uh, streaks. Um, it, there, there's a way to do that. If you scrape off less glaze, then you're, you're going to end up with a lighter colored uh, piece. And, you know, considering that the glaze I was using was a light glaze. And uh, the more streaks I make when I'm pouring the glaze, the more activity the surface is going to end up having. Yeah. Well, these are the kinds of things uh, that you are still making or were making until very recently when you started doing some smaller uh, pieces with a more uniform glaze, correct? Uh, so I am right right now, I'm not working on similar pieces, but it's a project that I'm, mm -hmm. you know I've been working on for years and I'll go back to and I'm 
using this same glazing technique on some other more uh, functional uh, mm -hmm. pieces or pieces that kind of blend art and uh, design. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, let's go back to, uh, we have some of your earlier work, some of your first works uh, in ceramics. I, I think that's the next slide, isn't it, Martha? Yes. Uh, now, these are so uh, strikingly different. First of all, they are suspended on the wall, correct? And they are, yes. They're yeah, and they, and they are more two-dimensional although they are uh, three-dimensional objects. So uh, could you place these in time uh, for the listeners to what we just saw and say a little bit about how these were created? So these were, um, I made these maybe a year into taking ceramics ceramics classes uh, in Beirut. That's where I took my first classes. And I was definitely still influenced by my training as a graphic designer. I felt much more comfortable when things were geometric, measured, uh, orderly. Uh, it just made sense to me. They looked right. They were not risky. They they worked. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but they were technically very challenging and kind of frustrating. Uh, they are built with uh, slabs. And um, when clay dries, it shrinks. And so these slabs are pulling in all directions. And uh, it, it's technically challenging to make pieces like that. And it's restrictive. Um, after a while, I started feeling like I needed to, to have more freedom in my creativity and uh, just start a piece and see where my hands mm -hmm. lead me in the process. So I, um, a few years down the road, I, there was a turning point in my <laughs> Uh, style and uh, I started, uh, you know, uh, I loved uh, the inspiration I got from nature and I, uh, I just went for it. I yeah. started. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions just to help us all understand a little more uh, what these things are physically. Are they hollow? Are they like shallow boxes and hollow? They are. So every side is a slab and the front is a curved slab that I had dried on a mold that I had made from a masonite board that I, you know, I had curved to the right, uh, uh, the right way. And then I had to move the different slabs and score their edges and put them together and construct this uh, 3D box-like structure. Okay, and then another question uh, uh, that I have in mind is it creates an opening like a window or a picture frame. Uh, did you think that that reference was one that you wanted to create? And did you ever try to put any image inside the opening? Uh, yeah, it was definitely intentional and it's, um, it, in a way, it's very similar to my graphic design college thesis project, which was about magazine and layering. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in the early 90s, the layering style of graphics and images was kind mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe not a new thing, but it was a, a very used design element. So that that's what my thesis was about. So I guess the influence of my training as a graphic designer and what I had been exposed to was definitely there. And um, I had created several pieces that refer to windows and openings and doors, uh, but I didn't uh, plan to put a, a, like an illustrated image. It was more geometric shapes and a perspective that leads you to that yellow like yeah. um, well, that's that's uh to me quite interesting to learn that somebody who is trained to be a graphic designer and work in two dimensions 
uh, is able to translate that kind of formal vocabulary and that way of thinking about uh, space and form into something three-dimensional. Uh, but the art historian in me, which sometimes I can't quite control, uh, sees references to things like the Bauhaus in 20s, 30s Germany and Hans Hoffmann and um, uh, Joseph Alpers. Are those artists that you are familiar with and did they have any impact on you? Uh, yeah, they did. Maybe not, you know, not, uh, I wasn't very conscious about it when I was working on this form, but they're definitely um, uh, designers that, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, studied about. And uh, it, so during my uh, years at the Corcoran, their names that yeah. were brought up often and their works were uh, familiar, definitely. Yeah. Well, I, I sort of suspected that that was the case, not just because of what I saw, but because I um, had friends and, and often spoke and sometimes uh, spoke to the students at the Corcoran while I was working. And I know those were names that were popular. Yes, <laughs> the definitely. Faculty and the students. So, uh, well, I guess I haven't completely lost it then. Uh, <laughs> let's look at the next slide, Martha. So these are the things that I think you first exhibited when you joined the MFA and were uh, uh, being juried into some of our shows. Am I correct? Uh, similar forms, yes. Well, tell us a little about, bit about the gl uh, glaze. The way the glaze is particularly at the top of the form, uh, it sort of opens up. That's uh, through the drying and firing process, correct? Uh, so this particular glaze, when it's thick, it does its own thing. It kind yes. of creases in some places. But having used it on uh, a number of vessels, I learned how to achieve that. I know that it has to be thick to do that. And so if you notice on the lower part of the vessel, there's less of it. You see more uh, the layering that, uh, that happens when uh, glaze drips over another layer but it's not so thick that it's creasing like on the very top where I kind of overglazed it purposefully. Yeah. So yeah, yes, yeah, that was the word I was going to, the thought that I was going to follow. So you did this purposely because you understood and had experience with the nature of the material itself. And so that organic and uh, spontaneous unplanned result is something that you were deliberately cultivating. I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's quite beautiful and it's a striking form. Uh, so it's 21 inches tall and eight inches uh, across at the base then? Uh, yes, it's uh, eight inches uh, wide if you were facing it, like if the spout was in front of you, but it's probably about uh, maybe 10 or 11 inches in the other direction. Oh, I see, I yeah. see. So it's really a dynamic form then. It's not a vessel where you, oh, go, Martha, do that. Flip it in. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, so that immediately transitions me to something that I was fascinated uh, about the way that you present these. Do, uh -huh. you, do you think that they are more effective in a group like this or singly? Or is it each piece, it's dependent on each individual piece, how you think it's best presented? I think that they work really well in both um, situations because what, um, what you see when you're looking at a single piece uh, are, uh, the details of the silhouette, the volume of the piece, but you also get to focus on the macro details, like the details of the textures. Um, and once they're grouped with another vessel or a multiple of them, a lot happens. They become 
like they're part of a community, they activate the space between them, they're, um, there's a communication between them, there's personalities that you discover, you know, the loud one, the, <laughs> the shy one, um, or, you know, there are several ways of looking at them, I guess. But, yeah, well, uh, I, this is a very effective image and presentation, um, and I really was nonplussed when you mentioned that some people see them as have as like people and having personalities. But now I get it. I mean, this really is true when you see a grouping like this. Uh, so I, I that this is wonderful. I could sit and look at this just like looking at a painting. Uh, you know, in the sense that there's so much to explore and you need to take some time to uh, interact and engage with it uh, in different light. Does the lighting, is that important to you? Um, so for taking pictures, yeah, definitely, because it really, um, it, it uh, definitely sets a mood. Um, I haven't had a chance to see them as a group um, in, a, in an exhibit yet, but uh, hopefully next year when I have a solo show, I'll, you know, I'll be able to play around with the installation. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> well, I hope you'll put me on your mailing list so I'll know when you do that and where you're doing it. Of course, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, Martha, next slide, please. Now, uh, now that we've seen that image a moment ago, and we've talked about this uh, sort of personalities, uh, now you have two pieces, same basic form, same basic glazing uh, and surface treatments. Uh, are they positioned this way because you find something meaningful, meaningful about this display? Uh, yeah, and this particular vessels, the spouts where um it, an important part of the vessel they they seem loud they seem to <laughs> be communicating something they had a lot to say so i thought that they were interesting paired up and um, um yeah that i mean that's that's how i decided to uh show them this way, yeah. Okay, a tricky question for artists, I think all of us, uh, is when you uh, present your work to the public, you have some control over how that's done, uh, usually. But when you are fortunate enough to sell a piece, then the person that's purchased it has the control and the authority. Would you be upset if someone purchased these two and uh, displayed them in separate rooms, for instance? I, I wouldn't because I noticed that each of these vessels uh, by itself talks about um, or refers to uh, nature obviously and uh, interesting fun details and they're pretty large, so I totally see them as an individual piece. In fact, I was um, so happy to see my first piece on a big display stand the first time I saw it in an exhibit, because normally I put them on the floor. That's It's the safest place to put them when you're just storing them. And uh, so seeing them from a different perspective, higher up, on a stand and in a way that I didn't think of displaying them um, is I think interesting to me. I like to, to discover how other people view them and uh, I'd like to see them displayed in all sorts of uh, settings. Well, now all of our conversation uh, and looking at the images has led me to uh, a question that I wonder if you've ever considered, because people refer to them as having personalities and sometimes uh, people see them as though they are uh, uh, living beings or human, have you ever considered large scale, you know, like a five foot tall vessel and actually putting it in nature? I, because of 
technical limitations, like where, you know, where I fire my pieces, I hadn't so far, but I'm actually starting to uh, fire some pieces in a uh, wood firing kiln with, with less size limitations. So that might be a thing that I, I'd be interested in exploring. I think it'd be fascinating to see something on that larger scale from you. Uh, it, it almost seems like the pieces are building to that direction, but I think you've taken a different turn uh, most recently, correct? Um, with uh, different type of vessels or? This, this, the smaller. Uh, oh, so, so I um, am working on a series of rock inspired forms and um, I, I would like to display them together with these other uh, nature uh, inspired vessels. Um, and I'm kind of planning ahead for the solo show that I'll be having and the rock forms will be part of the show. They have, um, they are um, a little more, they, they reflect more my state of mind and my human feelings that I feel. Um, and, you know, last year was quite introspective for a, a lot of us. And uh, I felt that my feelings when I was working on these rock forms uh, were reflected in, in my work. And so they might be a little uh, less representational of mm -hmm. nature features, uh, but um, they still relate to nature in the sense that they are rock forms. And are so, they the brown pieces that I think we have a couple of examples? Yes, of? yes. And I have a, a few in the background in the uh, room that I'm in and that I can show you as well. Okay, why don't you do that? And then Martha, is it the next slide that has a couple of those rock? Yeah, there we go. So, uh, Nada, go ahead and show us what you have near you if you want to. So how do I, uh, am I on, mm. like, can you see me? Yes, of course. You, oh, oh I didn't realize that you were seeing me all the time. I can't see, oh, here, yeah. Yes, there you go. So I don't know if you can see them well enough, but the, the forms that are right here. Uh-huh. And then... Oh, where'd the slides go? Okay. Martha, where'd the slides go? I, I turned it off so Nada could show us the work behind oh. it. Yes. And then there's a form right here to my left. Yes. Okay, why don't we go back to the slides because it's uh, much easier to see the piece that we have on the slide. Now, I, the first thing that pops up to me in addition to the uh, beauty of the form and the uh, surfaces is you uh, don't have a title for this, but you were quite articulate a moment ago about explaining how these uh, works reflect your sort of state of mind uh, during the period of COVID. So uh, why not have a title? So at some point I had a title and I can share it with you, but I, um, I had a bit of reservation about the title. So I had called it uh, My Lung, My Rock. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's interesting uh, because I was very conscious about, um, you know, the virus and what it was doing to people's bodies. And I was literally thinking of lungs and of what was happening inside people's lungs, you know, people who were affected by the virus. And I think that it was subconscious because when I was making this form, I wasn't necessarily thinking right there and then about uh, you know, the virus and its, eff uh, its effect on people. Uh, but when it, when it was done, that's what I saw in it. I saw a long form and the holes refer to uh, this vessel breathing and it yeah. connects its inner volume to the outside world around it. And I'd like to talk about the glaze. Before so you I, do that though, let yes. me uh, just ask, 
I see what look like some striations on the lower left. Uh, mm -hmm. It suggests this could be thrown on a wheel. What is the physical process of creating this form? Um, I start with a slab that I put on a uh, curved form. Um, in this case, it was a bisque, bisque uh, ceramic form that I made for this purpose to be able to, you know, have sort of curved forms uh, dry on, on the mold. And then I start uh, building the body with coils and the striations, the horizontal striations that you see are uh, basically the, what you can still see from the coils that have been smoothed to form a wall, but when, when the clay shrinks as it's drying, you kind of see the indentation between one coil and another uh, reappear. So and it's the, a it's a different part of the natural uh, the nature of the materials and a process that you deliberately don't completely control that you let a certain amount of uh, chance come into it, play. Exactly, yeah, and you see it uh, in some of my uh, large vessels. Uh, especially the ones that are glazed with a glossy uh, surface, you kind of see this on undulation of the coils. Uh, so you kind of see process yeah. through the glaze, which I don't mind. I think, you know, it speaks to how the piece was built. Yes. And you were going to say some more about the glaze, I think? Yes, because it's quite interesting. This piece was uh, formed and dried and then bisque fired. And then it uh, went into the wood firing kiln as a raw bisque piece. So I never glazed it myself, but uh, uh, ceramic artists who fire uh, in wood firing kilns, um, you know, get to experience that. Basically it's the ashes, that are burning in the wood firing kiln that glaze anything that's in the kiln when they come in contact with it. Yeah. Uh, so it's I didn't control this, but it's uh, you know I love the basically the streaks and all the patterns that uh, got formed on it. And the Japanese have uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. I explored this technique. Is that where you first learned of it, or was it simply by going to the uh, wood-fired kiln that uh, it happened? Uh, so I uh, I had read about it, and uh, I was nervous the first time I was taking many of my sculptural pieces to fire them. Uh, and that was uh, in Baltimore at Baltimore Clay Works. They have community mm -hmm. firings there. Mm -hmm. And so I discussed with my mentor, teacher, um, um, you know, asking him if he thinks I should glaze them ahead of time or not. And, you know, discussed my choice of uh, clay because it matters too. Um, and decided that I wanted to see what, what happens when they're bare and when I just let nature <laughs> you know, basically the, the ashes uh, glaze them. And I had some interesting happy accidents happen um, on some of them. Um, glaze fell from some shelves on my pieces and it, it uh, made some blobs of glaze. Um, and so I learned something. It was the happy accident that's going to uh, make me explore um, different things next time. I might just glaze partially yeah, on yeah. my other sculptures and let the ashes do the rest. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's part of the excitement of being an artist and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we have another slide, Martha? Let's take a quick look. Is this the last slide? Um, Unless there's something uh, really important that you want to share with us, Nada, I think we're giving the time. We want to open up for some questions. But first, do you have something that you'd like to say specifically about this piece? 
Um, so I haven't made a lot of pieces with, uh, the, you know, these glazes and actually I would love to get feedback because it's, it's what I'll be exploring uh, more in the near future. So if um, anyone watching has some comments or would like to say what they see in this piece, that would be great too. And maybe we okay. can take it from there. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a great segue into the Q&A &Q uh, portion. So uh, not that it's a requirement, uh, and I will certainly give feedback at a later time. <laughs> but right now, does anybody want to uh, share any thoughts about this glaze with Nada or ask any questions at all that you have in mind? I, I have a question. <laughs> um, so I, I'm sad. We have an artist who usually attends these Will Talks, um, who we actually did a Will Talk with recently, Jen Sterling. And her, she's a, a recent artist as well, um, but she works as a painter. Um, and her whole thing is just color expression. So when I was assembling your PowerPoint for tonight and I saw this piece, out of all the others, I was so interested that this is your most recent piece. So I, I definitely have a question on like sort of the movement of your work, if this is heading in a new direction for you. I read on your website that you do a lot of stuff with um, nature. Like, is this some reflection of like water or something? Um, and then also I just, why start slipping into color? I guess is my question. Um yeah, thanks, Martha. So uh, it's definitely about water and the energy and uh, power of uh, uh, water. Um, and this particular vessel um, definitely is, you know, clearly a jug form. I feel like one wants to maybe hug it and carry it. And so it makes me think a lot about the volume that's in it and the fact that it contains water and um, and also regarding the the bright colors I felt the urge to uh, make some forms that talk about uh, you know fresh uh, you know the, the fresh colors of summer and spring and uh, uh, nature waking up and um, I'm definitely going to explore more forms and more colors and it's I'm not in my comfort zone because you know I'm not into painting but I felt that um, it was the beginning of something new that I'd like to explore. <laughs> yeah it definitely like struck me as a kind of painting when I looked at it first it was really interesting so thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'll, I'll mention again, you're welcome to type them out in the chat and I'll read them off. Um, otherwise you can physically raise your hand on the camera and I'll, I'll see you. Um, or you can, I see Morgan raising her hand um, or you're welcome to unmute yourself and talk. I just try to keep an order going. So Morgan. Hi guys, hi Nada. Hi. Um, nice so, to see you Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> Nada already knows that I love her work, but um, I am, you know, I struck, I loved listening to you talk about the wood firings that you had done and how the ash sort of plays a part in the firing of the clay and sort of the remnants that it leaves behind, which I think is so interesting. And I tend to work uh, with a lot of like natural things myself in my work. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you, do you find that you incorporate other natural things? Like I, I always want to incorporate something else from nature into my work. And I love the idea of being able to like physically incorporate wood ash or hair or you know something else that do you do that ever uh, so i have uh, actually i show you right now a raku piece that i've made and uh in the raku firings uh we get a chance to you know uh basically play around with what's in the container that uh, that the, uh, the vessel or object is placed in. But uh, I haven't done that. You definitely can't do that in an electric kiln, especially if it's not yours. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't think that you can do it either in the gas firing kilns that um, I get to use. But 
possibly I might explore that in my Raku firings. That, yeah. And um, many, many years back, I used to use uh, some, I can't remember the exact name of the metal, but there's metal that doesn't uh, melt um, when you fire your ceramic pieces. So I, I did explore a little bit, um, you know, incorporating um, strips of metal in the, in the wall hangings that I had made. I, I see there's one uh, chat question, and because of time, maybe we'll make that the last question. It's not a chat question, Will. It was me asking you to mute your email. <laughs> me? Did it beep again? It always beeps, Will. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even hear it. I was so enjoying our conversation. Well, uh, we are running out of time, and I'm sorry I didn't catch that, uh, Martha, and uh, we'll have to edit that out again. Uh, so that's on me. Um, but I will say, Nada, first of all, thanks so much for uh, doing this because I really think your work is quite beautiful and quite impressive. And the introduction of color uh, really changed the whole character of uh, vessel form that we had seen before. It's much lighter and there is something about it that is, um, I guess, softer, but I mean that in a good way. Uh, your forms and your surfaces are very strong, uh, but that is something I hope you'll continue to explore uh, with the lighter colored glazes in the reference to water and air too, perhaps. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's great feedback. And I really, you know, I'm happy to get feedback on uh, this specific vessel. Yeah, well, uh, thanks again. And thanks all of you for uh, listening in and participating tonight. And we'll see uh, many of you again in two weeks.